my grandparents lived and worked basically all their married life on a farm. Uh, my, my grandfather grew up on a farm and when he got married his dad helped him to purchase a farm and that's where my grandfather and my grandmother spent most of their lives right up until they, they retired which was about the time that I went to college. So my growing up years was, was visiting grandparents on that dairy farm, 160 acre dairy farm down in southern Lancaster County. We would go down often, we would go down often to help out with chores and help out with things, the different seasons, when it was time to bale, whether it was hay or straw, and bring that in, we were there to help. Uh, we, we were the backup crew when they would take those rare trips or take that rare time off. We were the backup crew in the barn. Uh, that was always fun at 4 o'clock in the morning before school. Uh, so I spent a lot of time down there, a lot of time in that setting. With a herd of cows, always a few calves and some young heifers around that were on their way up and soon to work into the rotation with assorted pigs and every now and then some chickens and maybe some sheep. My siblings and I and cousins that would hang around with us, we learned early and we were reminded often, if you open a gate, you make doggone sure you close that gate in a timely, timely fashion. Now there were, there were a lot of gates too. There were gates to, to pens and there were gates to stalls inside the barn to separate the calves and for the, the cows to go into when it was time to be milked. And there were, there were gates and there were doors on the barn itself to keep the cold out and to keep them in. There were gates to and from the pasture. There was one here and one here and everything had to be lined up just right or you might have a problem. You know, uh, neglect one of those gates, you neglect, you neglect any one of them, and, and a small disruption, a small disruption would be the best case scenario. Whoops, one got out, and then, and then everybody goes running, and you herd that cow or that sheep or whatever it is back in. But, you know, every farmer, every farmer has a list of, of, of nightmares, right? One of those nightmares is that the animals get out and onto the road, you know? Simplest way for that kind of thing to happen, whether it was a small consequence or maybe a big consequence, the simplest way for that to happen was that somebody, oh, I forgot, and left a gate. Or I thought I had it latched. I, I can remember more than one tearful conversation that, that, that a gate came open and a cow went out and my grandfather had a quick, answer, quick little retort and that wasn't his way. Hey, what happened? Oh, and, oh I thought it was closed. The simplest way to get into a lot of trouble real quick was for one of those gates not to be shut properly. Today's passage includes the third I am. We're looking at the I am statements of Jesus for the next several weeks here. The third I am, if you haven't guessed it, is Jesus saying, I am the gate. And that's what we want to think about, and that's what we want to try to understand a little better today. So let me share with you the scripture. This scripture is found from John chapter 10, 1 through 10. John chapter 10, verse 1 through 10. I invite you to follow along the screen, or better yet, open up your Bible or your pew Bible so you can keep that open there and refer back as we go along. Here we hear Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So 
so here we have it. Jesus says, I am the gate. And as we begin to think about this saying of Jesus, we had, I am the bread of life, and we have, I am the light of the world. As we begin to think about Jesus saying, I am the gate, we should notice Jesus says it twice. He says it two times in this passage. First of all, he says it in verse 7, therefore, when he didn't understand what he was trying to tell him, he, he kind of simplifies and says, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. And then again in verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Now in verse 7, the first time he says it, it seems that he's describing who the gate is for, namely the sheep. In my grandparents' case, the gate was usually for the cows, but for Jesus here in this, this teaching, the, the gate was for the sheep. In verse 9, the statement, I am the gate, is tied with a purpose. We see a sense of purpose about Jesus being the gate. And the purpose is, it's about some kind of saving. All who enter through me will be saved and they'll come in, they'll go out and they'll, they're going to find or they're going to have pasture. So the first one gives us the, the who it's for and the second statement gives us a sense of purpose. But for now, let's just concentrate. Let's just really dig down a second and think practically about the gate, that idea. What is a gate? What is a, what, what's the role? This is not a rhetorical question. What's the role or the purpose of a gate? Anybody? What's the role or the purpose of a gate? Re regulate, I heard. Regulate something. I'm, you guys are, are Johnny on the spot because this morning, the first service, I had to like, come on, I'm serious. Now you're talking at once and I can't quite hear. Uh, regulate, what else was it? Keep something in. Anything else? Keep something out. Safety, let you in, let you out. It's, it's, all of, it's all of these things, really. It's all of these things. Quite simply, a gate gives access. A gate gives access that you can go in. It gives access that you can come out. And in the process, it either keeps in or it keeps out. And if you're in, hopefully there's some safety. So it's all these things together, but it's really especially about access. Somehow you've got an enclosure. Somehow you've got an enclosure which is bounded and defined in some way. I can remember on my grandparents' farm, they had, a, they had the main barn here where they would milk the cows and where it was really bad weather, the cows would stay in during, during that bad weather. But over here on the other side, there was a, the, the heifer barn. And that was for the ones that weren't quite ready. And th this barn over here was a very simple, small thing because they only had a couple at a time. It had, actually, it had a solid stone wall. It had a solid stone wall that they could come out of the, the barn, out of the enclosures, and have some outside time. It was a solid wall. Over here, out of the main barn where you would milk the cows, they would go out into the pasture. And it was, the pasture was defined by a barbed wire. That was a lot of fun when you were a little kid because my grandfather loved to walk up to the barbed wire with you and say, hey, take a look at this. And, and you'd be looking and he'd grab your hand and you'd grab the barbed wire. He loved that trick. <laughs> uh, you know, so the, the, however it's bound, whether it's a solid wall, whether it's a fence or something even flimsy, there's something that defines this space that shows what is enclosed, that, that sets an area apart and, and, and essentially restricts it in general, except at the gate. In the barbed wire, there was a spot you could open it up and you could pass in, you could pass out. Back at the heifer barn, there was, a, there was one of those metal kind of gates and you open up the pin and you could swing it open, you could, you could go in. The gate could be closed to close the enclosure off, it could be open to open it up. And, and, that was, and, and that was the purpose. Gates are about access. Some, some things only have like one gate. <laughs> There was one gate that went into, the, into the, 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 the heifer enclosure there. There was one gate. You didn't need a whole lot of room there. There were, there were multiple gates. There were multiple gates in the barn, multiple doors, ways to get into the barn. When the cows came out of the pasture, they could go in here or here or here. And they knew the, the, the gate or the door that they were supposed to go into for their stall. If, how many of you have ever been to some place like Beaver Stadium? You went to watch a football game. You know, you look into this big stadium, you walk up to it, and how many gates are there? <laughs> Depends on where your tickets are that you go in. Is it gate A, B, or C, or I don't even know what the gates are called, but there's gates all the way around. So your enclosure can have one gate, it can have a couple, it might have a whole bunch if it's a big, if it's a big venue, the, but the purpose is the same always, whether it's one or a dozen or more. It's to 
is to control, to give and to control access. So now, if Jesus is the gate, if Jesus is the gate, what is it that he gives access to? That's what we want to think about here to understand what Jesus is saying to us today. If he is the gate, what is it that he gives us access to? Well, if you go back to verse 9, whoever enters through the gate, and that gate is Jesus, whoever enters through the gate or Jesus, it says, will be saved. What Jesus gives access to isn't real estate. What Jesus gives access to is salvation. It's to God himself. It's to God himself. Now, if Jesus is the gate, and he's giving access to God, giving access to salvation, what is then the fence or the wall that Jesus is the gate in? Well, what kind of boundary is there when you consider God? What kind of boundary is there when you consider God? What is it that defines, the, the fence or the, or the wall defines the in and the out, the, the enclosure or the outside? What, what, defines, what defines who is in or under God's care or able to find pasture that God provides versus those who are on the outside looking in? What is it that defines that? Anybody? You're close. Survey said, "Ant." <laughs> the thing that defines the thing that defines who is in in God's pasture, in God's care, versus those who are out and looking in is God's word. It's the law. It's the law that defines and, and, and is the boundary for God. If you, if you follow the law, if you are following God's word, you're on the inside. If you're not, you're on the outside. At least for centuries and centuries leading up to Jesus, that's what it was. The thing that separated God from the world, the thing that the Israelites thought that they had going for them and that they were in was God's word and God's law. That was the thing that separated them from from the world. Now that wall was a formidable thing though. If you've read your Bible, if you've studied there and particularly dug deep and thought about all those laws, there's over 613 laws that God has in the Old Testament. If you just want to count them and enumerate them and then there's how you interpret them. That wall was extremely formidable. That standard, that thing that defined, that thing that separated the world from God was extremely formidable. It demanded a lot from those who would remain on the inside, who would remain in God's good graces. In fact, basically, according to the law, perfection, perfection, sinlessness was required to stay on the inside. When that was missing, when people sinned and broke God's law, what was required was sacrifice. In the analogy of a wall or a fence, God's word uh, as a wall or a fence between him and the world, people, people were constantly, constantly tearing down pieces, tearing down sections of that wall or snipping that fence every time they sinned. Every time that people sin, they're, they're tearing at that fence. They're, they're tearing at that wall. Sacrifice was the way that it got fixed. Sacrifice was essentially wall building or wall rebuilding. You know, you tear down a, a stone out of that wall. God's, God's law is not destroyed. God's law is not nullified, okay? Uh, but, but for the person who offended, the person who's pulling it down, the person who's messing things up, sacrifice was the way that they built it up, again, the way that God intended, and they put themselves on the right side of the fence. But if you know your Old Testament and think about it, that was a big job, wasn't it? It was a losing effort. It was a losing effort to try to stay on the inside in God's good grace and God's favor by following the law because there simply were so many of them and we're so messed up, right, Seth? <laughs> it was a losing effort. And so God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus. And now... Now with Jesus, there is a way to God with the law intact. Understand? With Jesus, there's a way to God that the law stays intact. Any 
one who will come to God by way of Jesus becomes a sheep of his own fold and the wall is intact. And the wall, the law, the word of God, the will of God stands there defining what God wants and who is in his will and what God wants and those who are outside his will. It turns out here, we're starting to see with Jesus, when Jesus comes, hey, this, this being in God's favor, this being in with God, it, it's not just for the Jews anymore. God has made a way to him for anyone. God has made a way to him for all people. Anyone can come to God through Christ. The law is there, but anyone can come to God through Christ and have a new life in him, blessed. Now, if Jesus is the way, if Jesus is the gate, we want to recognize, we must recognize what is not the way. What is not the way? In John 10, 1, if you have your Bibles open still, in, John, in the first verse we read, John 10, 1, Jesus describes anyone who seeks to come into the pen, into the enclosure, by any other way other than the gate. Meaning anyone who would come to God by another way other than Jesus. It describes them as a thief or a robber. Oof. That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Especially when we consider the grace of God. I mean, we believe as one of the tenets of our faith that God desires everyone to be saved, right? Amen. It's not just for us here at Rules, right? It's not just for the Methodist Church. or No, God desires everyone to be saved. It calls those who would come to him by any other way than Jesus, the gate, as thieves and robbers. That might sound harsh, considering the graciousness of God, but we cannot dismiss Jesus' explicit words. What this means, to try to climb in, to try to climb in and bypass Jesus, if you will, not to avail yourself of the way that God has prescribed, is essentially to try to bypass or to ignore God's law or God's word. Well, God, I want what you have for me, and I want what you want for my life, but I want it my way, not your way. That's essentially what it's saying to climb over the wall or to live in sin and think that God will reward you with pasture and protection and safety and blessing and life. God's word or God's law it's the boundary that separates the world from God and from the full blessings of God. And guess what? God is the one who built it. God is the one who prescribed it. God is the one who defines it, not us. To intentionally seek to scale this fence, if you will, to scale that wall of God's word is to do violence to God's word. The boundaries are God's. He is the one that defines what is righteous and what is acceptable, what leads to life and what does not. We do not set the terms by which God saves and blesses. God does. Our way, our way to blessing is to do our best with all of God's word, actively and intentionally, but ultimately, trusting Jesus to approach God. That's what it means that he is the gate. We seek and we strive like generations before, generations before Jesus. We seek and we strive to live according to God's word, to live according to God's law, to live according to God's will. But when we fail, and mark my words, we will and we do, when we fail, the, 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 the thing that saves us that, that sets us apart and brings us in is not that we sacrifice, it's that we rely on Jesus Christ. We enter into God's blessing through the gate that is Jesus. That's what it means, that He is the gate. I cannot stress that enough, that He, Jesus, Jesus alone gives access to God. 
lot of folks in the church today, there's a lot of folks in the world today that think that they know and think that they see Jesus and think that they're okay, but they're not doing it God's way. Oh, I, yeah, I know all about it. I, I see him, yep. They're not doing it God's way, and that doesn't work. If I, think back, if I think back to those days on my grandparents' farm, you could stand a lot of places in the farm, and you could look over some fence, and you could see what was on the other side. You could see. You know, if it was a barbed wire fence, that was no effort at all. <laughs> you could see very easily. But even, even near the barn where you had some solid stone walls there, there was, there was a stone wall at one spot, and there was a feeding trough down there. As kids, we like to climb up on that wall there and walk along the top and watch the cows eating their, their hay and their insulage before they would come in. We could stand and we could see a, across the way, but there was a difference. There was a difference between inside and outside. It may not have been quite as apparent to us, but the cows knew it. On the inside, that's where the water was. On the inside, that's where the feed was. On the inside, you didn't have to dodge things like tractors running up and down the road. There was a difference. Now think about that spiritually. How many today, how many today have heard of God and have heard of Jesus? And maybe they can even tell you all kinds of things. Oh, I took some comparative religion courses when I was in school. And they can tell you all about ins and outs and all kinds of things. In essence, they can see God and they can see Christ. And yet they're essentially on the outside looking in because God is walled off to them. God is walled off to them. Why? Because they won't open the gate. That is Jesus to get on the inside. Maybe they feel guilty. There's some that won't ever quite make their, their, their way, the whole way to the cross, to Christ, because they're guilty. You think, you think about the parable that Jesus taught. Two men went up to the temple to pray, and one of them will stand at a distance and beat his chest, and Lord, have mercy on me, I'm a, I'm a sinner. Some people take that to another. I'm so bad. I'm so broken. I'm so, I'm so, so, so sinful that God couldn't accept me. They, they feel guilty, and so they don't ever open the gate. Some people are too proud. Some people just think, I don't need that. I know better. I don't need that. I have my religion by myself in my deer stand or in the bass boat or on the golf course or reading my Sunday paper with the coffee. I, no, I don't need that. They feel they don't need to. They see God. They think they know God, but they're on the outside looking in because they don't acknowledge God really and open the gate. Think about it. The Egyptians led by Pharaoh, they saw the power of God as God unleashed those, those plagues or the Egyptians thought they were plagues. The Israelites might have called them miracles because they were the thing that was freeing them. Egypt and Pharaoh saw these things happen, and but, but did they did they see did they submit when they experienced the power of God? They recognized God and his power, but they did not submit. Think about Judas. He spent three years with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He he heard Jesus teaching. He witnessed miracles. He saw him feed the five thousand. He saw Jesus heal people. He saw Jesus walking on water. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. But in the end, what did Judas do? He closed the gate. He closed the gate. He betrayed Jesus. We're not saved by simply seeing God or seeing Jesus, even knowing God. Or we're not saved even, think of Judas, we're not saved even by being close. We are saved. We are God's sheep. When we come to God through Jesus confessing our sins, professing Him as Lord and Savior of our lives, submitting to Him and following Him every day of our lives to the best of our ability. That's what it means that Jesus is the gate and we would be His sheep. If we go back to our text, one final note that I would make here today, one final note. If the promise pasture, meaning God's provision, isn't enough. If the promise of saving, being rescued, isn't enough to 
incentivize us to open the gate, to turn to Jesus. Verse 10, verse 10 adds one more element, one final aspect for us to consider to choose the gate. If you have your Bibles open, you can take a look there. In verse 10, we read, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, no matter how good you may feel life is, it is only by way of Jesus that we really, truly have life. Now, the person who doesn't know Jesus doesn't know what they're missing. Those of you who have accepted him and have seen your lives change, you know what he's talking about. But those who don't know Jesus don't know what he's talking about and have a really hard time to accept this, but, but here it is. The only way to really truly have life, have it to the full, is to have Jesus. And as I'm thinking about this, I thought about an analogy. How many here have had cataract surgery, Patrick? <laughs> and, and probably a dozen others. If you've had cataract surgery, you know what that's like. You know, here you are, and you're going about your day, and you're going about your week, and you're going about your year, and you're seeing things. But what happened? I mean, over time, it's just like it gets dimmer, and it's just not right. It's such a slow, gradual thing that it sneaks up on people often quite a bit before they realize that there's an issue. But when you go to the doctor and he does his little wiggling and jiggling in there and he gets done and the drops are done and you're done, it's like, wow, I didn't realize how much I had been missing. Anybody can relate to that, whether it's cataracts or something else? You, you've lived with something for such a long time that when it changed, now all of a sudden you realize how much you've been missing and that you really weren't seeing the whole picture or getting the whole thing. That's what, we're, that's, that's what it is with Jesus. There's so many people who live their lives and think they have it all, but they don't. And the only way that they will really realize what life is truly about and fully about and completely about is they have got to accept Christ and go through Him to receive all the blessings that God has in store for them. Now I realize that to accept this, if you don't know Jesus, and he's talking to a lot of people who haven't like fully bought into this yet, to accept this is a matter of trust. But then, let's think about it. To live without God. To live without Christ. Doesn't that mean that you're trusting in yourself? trust yourself or you can trust God if you consider where you stand today in your heart whether you're truly a sheep or not whether you're really in or out take a good look a close look and see whether the fruit of your life and the experience of your life is, is measuring up to the promises in Scripture. Does your life look as full and abundant and green and bountiful as what God promises in Scripture? Or maybe, maybe is it greener on God's side than what you're experiencing and you realize, I don't think I've actually gone through the gate. You're just standing at the fence and looking over. God's side of the fence, inside the gate, through Jesus, by Jesus, there is forgiveness and peace and mercy and grace. And if you haven't done so before, if you realize that you were in, but you've gone wandering like a lost sheep, you snuck under the fence or you busted a hole in it, you just wandered out. If you've never accepted or if you've gone wandering, I hope this scripture today I hope the Spirit today encourages you to knock, knock at the gate and turn to Jesus and accept Him that you may be accepted in, that you may be accepted into the joy and the blessing of belonging, really belonging, belonging to God, belonging to God, accept Him that you might have life and have it to the full. It's all waiting on the inside through the gate. Enter here through the gate.